trying this mass thing. It's really cool. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Hooray, 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 hooray. Um, this is our uh, third night, fourth performance of a Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, and we're just delighted, 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 delighted beyond being able to talk about it that you're here and that we're all here, you know, experiencing live theater. So thank you so much for coming. Um, I have to I always have to remind myself to say my name, so I, your name here. Um, so I'm John Fitzgerald, and back there somewhere is Jason Katz, and we uh, run the theater department. And so um, on behalf of all of us, you know, and people behind the scenes, um, we again welcome you um, to the show. Um, we are recording tonight, so you can see some cameras out there. Um, and so we want to make sure that you are a part of the experience, right? So I'm going to count to three, one, two, three, and then, like, you'll say your first name, okay? Ready, ready, ready? Live theater. One, two, three. <laughs> Great. I think I heard two, let's say, Haley's, right? So I'll count to three, and you'll say your last name, right? One, two, three. <laughs> Okay, so in a thousand years, they'll watch that and you'll be there. So thanks so much. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, so, um, so, um, so two um, inspirational things today. Um, and so um, one of them was that we had our first uh, middle school matinee since Cinderella, which is going back three, four years. And so we had a bunch of kids from Wood come um, and see the show during the school day today. Um, and then afterwards, we know what we often do is like a talk back. So the high school kids um, came out and they talked to the middle school kids. Um, and, and that, and they just like watching them watch each other was just really kind of amazing. Um, and I heard someone tell a story today about a student of theirs told them about they came to the thing and that inspired them and they're in the play now. So, so that was really inspiring. Um, another really inspiring thing today was the number of teachers um, who said, oh, I have a student in the play, so I'll see you tonight, I'll see you tomorrow, or whatever. So, uh, out there in live theater land, if you're a teacher, you want to raise your hand, there's one right there. Um, so, so, thank you for coming. We got this mask thing going on for a little while longer, I guess, so thanks for wearing that. Um, we have concessions out in the lobby. Um, and the concessions help us help the kids do things including we're in about a month, we're gonna go to the State Thespian Festival, which is, uh, which is also the first time in a number of years and super fun for everybody. So that helps to get us there. So your Skittle, you know, makes dreams come true. So, um, so and then, if, but if you don't mind making dreams come true in the lobby, so we don't have the wrappers going on in here. So uh, there is no, there are no cell phones in Fairyland, um, so um, if you don't mind turning yours off or at least turning the sound off, um, we would just love that. Um, and there are just all kinds of people, there are all kinds of people that make this happen, um, and, um, and, and it's hard to thank everybody. If you look in the program, there's a lot of people that we listed that we wanted to thank. Also in the program, there are sponsors, right? And so people who, uh, you know, businesses in the community who help keep the theater program here running. So um, so look through and if you are able, go to their, their shops and their places of business. Um, and we're particularly grateful to Finley uh, Jeep um, in Wilsonville. So you like the show, you feel like buying a new car, just head over there, you probably camp out, it's fine. Um, and um, so yeah. Um, and if you have a favorite teacher at Wilsonville and you want to buy a car for them, you know, feel free to do that. I can't tell you what to do, but you know, like you can think about that. So um, anyway, last thing is um, it might take your ears a secity sec to get used to the Shakespeare. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's the thing. So you'll, you'll get immersed in the world. It's a, it's a comedy and we think it's pretty funny. Uh -huh. um, and so if you see something funny, we totally meant it. Um, so feel free to laugh, and that helps uh, help us helps us all uh, enjoy the experience. So, anyway, here we go, jumping into Fairyland. Thanks again for coming.
nuptial hour draws on apace. Four happy days bring in another moon, but oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires, <laughs> like to a stepdame or a dowager, long with rain out the young man's revenue. Oh, four days will quickly steep my themselves Lord. in night. Oh, four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow, new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. My lord. Oh, go, Philistrate! Stir up the Athenian youth to merriment, awake the pert and nimble spirit of mirth, turn melancholy forth to funerals, the pale companion is not for our pomp. <laughs> Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword, and won thy love doing thee injuries, but I will wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Oh. Happy be, Theseus, our renowned duke. Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Full of vexation come I with complaint. Complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius, my noble lord. This man hath my permission to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander, my gracious duke. This man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, <laughs> thou, Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast by moonlight sung with feigning voice verses of feigning love and stolen the impression of her fantasy with bracelets of thy ugh, hair. <laughs> Cease. Curse these linens. Gnats. <laughs> trifles. No gays. Sweetmeats. Messengers. Of strong prevailment and unhearted youth. With cunning hast thou filched at my daughter's heart. Turned her obedience, which to me, to stubborn harshness. My gracious duke, be it, be it so, she will not clear before your grace. Wed, Demetrius, I beg the ancient privilege of Athens. As she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman or to her death, according to our law immediately provided in that case. What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid, to you. Your father should be as a god, one who composed your beauties, yea, and one to whom you are but as a form in wax, by him imprinted, and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is. But in this time, wanting your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. I would my father looked forth my eyes. Rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I made bold, nor how it may concern my modesty in such a presence here to plead my thoughts. But I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Either to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men. <laughs> Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires. Know of your youth, examine well your blood. For whether if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun. For I to be in shady cloister mused to live a barren sister all your life, chanting faint hymns to the cold, fruitless moon. Thrice blessed they that master so their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage. But earthlier happy is the rose distilled than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows, lives, and dies in a single blessedness. So will I grow, so live, so die, my lord. Ere I will, my virgin patent up unto his lordship his unwished yoke. My soul content not to give sovereignty. <sighs> Take time to pause. And by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me for everlasting bond of fellowship. <laughs> Upon that day, either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius, as he would, or on Diana's altar, to protest for I austerity and single life. Relent, sweet Hermia, and Lysander, yield up thy crazed title to my certain right. Demetrius, you have her father's love. Pet me out first. Do you marry him? <laughs> Scornful Lysander, true, he hath my love, and what is mine, 
my love shall render him, and she is mine. And all my right her, I do estate unto to me. I am, my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his. My fortunes every way is fairly ranked, if not with vantage as Demetrius is. But what is more than all these boasts can be? I am beloved of Fulvius Hermia. Why may I not then prosecute my rights? Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Nedar's daughter, Helena, and won her soul. She dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. Well, I must confess I have heard so much, and with Demetrius thought to have spoken thereof. But being overfull of self-affairs, my mind did lose it. But Demetrius, come, and come, Aegeus. Ah, you shall go with me. I have some private schooling for you both. As for you, fair Hermia, look you to fit your fancy to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means we may extenuate to death or to a vow of single life. <laughs> come, my Hippolyta. What cheer, my love. Demetrius and Aegeus, go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptials and confer with you of something nearly that concerns yourselves. With duty and desire, we follow you. How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? Be like for want of rain, which I could well beteem them from the tempest of my eyes. I mean, for aught that I could ever read, could ever hear by Taylor history, the course of true love never did run smooth. But either it was different in blood. Oh, cross, too high to be enthralled too low. Or else it stood upon the choice of friends. Oh, spite, fool to be engaged to young. Or else miscraft in respect of years. Oh, hell. To choose love by another's eyes. But if there was sympathy in choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning in the collied night, and ere a man hath power to say, Behold, the jaws of darkness do devour it up. So quick bright things come to confusion. If then true lovers have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Let us teach our trial patience, because it is a customary cross as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, poor fancies follow it. A good persuasion. Therefore, hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, a dowager, of great revenue, and she hath no child. Of Athens is her house, remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, will I marry thee? And to that place the sharp Athenian locks shall not pursue us. If thou lovest me then, steal forth from thy father's house tomorrow night to meet in the wood, a league without the town, where I did meet once with Helena to do an observance of the morn of May. There will I wait for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus's doves, by that which knitteth souls and prospers loves, by the fire that burned the Carthage queen when false women under sail was seen, all the vows that men ever broke in number more than ever women spoke. In that same place thou hast appointed me, tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. Keep promise, love. Look, uh, here comes Helena. Godspeed, fair Helena, whither away? Call you me fair, that fair again unsafe. Demetrius loves your fair. Oh, were favor so yours would I catch fair Hermia ere I go? My ear should catch your voice, my eye your eye, my tongue would touch your tongue, sweet melody. Oh, were the world mine, Demetrius being baited, the rest I'd give to be you translated. Oh, teach me how you look and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Oh, that your frowns would teach my smiles such skill. Give him curses, yet he gives me love. Oh, that my prayers could such affection move. The more I hate him, the more he follows me. The more I love him, the more he hateth me. His father. 
Holly Helena is no fault of mine, none but your beauty. Would that fault were mine. Sweet comfort, he no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself will fly this place. <laughs> Before the time I did Lysander see, King Athens was a paradise to me. Told us by what graces in my love to dwell, he hath turned a heaven unto a hell. Helen, to you are mine to be well enfold. Tomorrow night, when Phoebe doth behold, her silvery visage in the watery glass, the liquid pearl, the bladed grass, a time that lover's flight still doth conceal, through Athens' gates we have devised to steal. And in the wood where often you and I upon faint primrose beds we used to lie, and seeing our bosoms with such healthful sweet, there Lysander and myself shall meet, and thence from Athens turn away our eyes to seek new friends and stranger company. Farewell, sweet playfellow. Pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander. We must starve our sight from lover's food till morrow deep midnight. I will, my love. Helena, adieu. As you on him, Demetrius, note on you. How happy some or other some can be. Through Athens I am thought as fair as she, but what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know all that he do know. And as he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes, so I, admiring of his quality, things base and vile, holding no quantity, love can transpose to form and dignity. Love sees not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. Nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste. Wings and no eyes figure unheedy haste. And therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is so often beguiled. As waggish boys in game themselves forswear, so the boy of love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eyne, he hailed down oath that she was only mine. And when some heat from Hermia did felt, so he dissolved, showers of oaths did melt. I will go tell him of fair Hermia's plight. Then to the woods will he tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein I to enrich my pain, to have his sight thither and back again. You are best to call them generally man by man according to the script. Here is the scroll of every man's name, which is thought fit through all Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and the Duchess on his wedding day at night. First, good Petroquins, say what the play treats on, then read the names of the actors, and so grow to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and the most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. A very good piece of work, I assure you, and a merry. Now, good Petroquins, call forth your actors by the scroll. Enter as I call you, Nick Thoughtus. Ready, name what part I am for and proceed. The weaver, you are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? A lover that kills himself most gallant for love. <laughs> that will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms. I will condole in some measure. To the rest. 
Yet my chief humor is for the tyrant. I could play Ercles rarely, or a part to tear a cat in to make all split. The raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates, and Phoebus' car shall shine from far, far. <laughs> and meek and mar the foolish fates. <laughs> Now name the rest of the players. This is Ericles' favorite, tyrant's favorite. A lover is more condoled. Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Here, Frederick Quince. Flute, you must take Thisbe on you. What is Thisbe? A wandering knight. It is the lady that Pyramus must love. Nay, Fate, let me not play a woman. I have a beard coming. That's all one. <laughs> You shall play it in a mask, and you may speak as small as you will. And I may hide my face, let me play Thisbe too. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Thisney, Thisney. Ah, Pyramus, my lovely, my Thisbe, dear and lady dear. No, no, you must play Pyramus, and flute, you Thisbe. Well, proceed. Robin Strobling, the tailor. Dear Petra Quince, Robin Strobling, you must play Thisbe's mother. Tom Snout, the tinkerer. You, Petra Quince. You, Pyramus's father. Myself, Thisbe's father. Snug the joiner, do the lion's part. And I hope here is a play fitted. Yes, you have the lion's part written. Pray you, if it be, give it me, for I am slow to study. You may do it ex tempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Ah! I will roar that I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar that I will make the youth say, let him roar again. Let him roar again. I should do it too terribly. You frighten the duchess and the ladies like they would shriek. And that were enough to hang us all. That would hang us and our mother's son. I grant you, friends, if we should fright the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice so that I will roar you You I will roar you as twere any nightingale. You can play no part to Pyramus. The Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man as one shall see in a summer's day, a most lovely, gentleman-like man. Therefore, you must needs play Pyramus. <laughs> well, I will undertake it. <laughs> what beard were I best to play it in? Why, what you will. I will discharge it in either your straw color beard, your orange tawny beard, your purple ingrain beard, or your French crown color beard, your perfect yellow. Some of your French crown, some no hair at all. Then you shall play a pair of face. <laughs> but masters, here are your parts. And I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to call them by tomorrow night and meet me in the palace wood, a mile without the town by moonlight. For if we meet in the city, we shall be dogs of company and our devices known. In the meantime, I will draw up a bill of properties such as our play wants. I pray you, fail me not. There we will meet, and we may rehearse most obscenely and courageously. <laughs> Take pains. Be perfect. Adieu. At the Duke's opening. Enough. Hold or cut those strings.
the pale, throw flood, throw fire. I do wander everywhere, twisted in the moon's sphere. And I serve the fairy queen to do her orbs upon the green. The cowslips tall her pensioners be. Those gold coats foxy see. Those blue boots fairy boots. And those freckles live their sabers. Now I must go and seek some dewdrops here, and hang a pearl on every cowslip's ear. Farewell, thou lob of spirits, I'll be gone. The queen and all our elves come here anon. The king's own keep and brass is here tonight. Take heed, the fair queen come not within his sight. For Oberon is passing fair and rash, because that she and the tenant hath. A lovely boy stolen from an Indian king. She never had so sweet a change since. And jealous Oberon would have a child, like to this train to trace the forest wild. But she perforce withholds the child, crowns him with flowers, and makes him all rejoice. And now they never meet in grove or green, in fountain clear or spangled starlight sheen. But they do swear for fear all their elves creep into acorn cups and hide them there. Either I mistake your shape and make it quite, or else you are that shrewd and knavish sprite called Robin Goodfellow. Are you not he that frights the maidens of the villagery? Skim milk and sometimes labor in the quern, and bootless make the breathless housewife churn, and sometimes make the drink bear no barm, mislead night wanderers laughing at their harm. <laughs> Those that have goblin call you in sweet talk. They do your work and they shall have good luck. Are you not he? Thou speakest right. I am that merry wanderer tonight. I jest to Oberon and make him smile, while I a flaxen bean-fed horse beguile, neighing the likeness of a filly bull. Eh? <laughs> and sometimes lurk I in the gossip's bowl, in very likeness of a roasted crab. Oh, when she sits against her lips I ball, and on her wither do let pour the ale. <laughs> The wise is on telling the saddest tale. Sometime a three-foot stool mistaketh me. <laughs> and slip I from her bomb down to hop she. <laughs> and tailor cries and falls into a cough. And the whole choir hold their tits and laugh. And wax in their mirth and knees and swear a merry hour was never wasted there. <laughs> oh, the ruined fairy. Here comes Oberon. Oh, and here my mistress. Would that he were gone. What jealous Oberon fairies skip hence I have forsworn his bed and company. Terry Brash Wanton, am I not thy lord? Then I must be thy lady. <laughs> but I know when thou hast stolen away from fairyland and in the shape of corn sat all day <laughs> on pipes of corn and verse and love to amorous Phyllida. <sighs> Why art thou here? Come from the farthest step of India, but that forsooth the bouncing Amazon, your buskined mistress and your warrior love to Theseus must be wedded, and you come to give their bed joy and prosperity. How canst thou thus for shame, Titania, glance at my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus? Didst thou not lead him through the glimmering night from Paragonia? whom he ravished, and make him with fair Aeglis break his faith with <gasps> Ariadne and Antiopa? These are the forgeries of jealousy, <laughs> and never since the middle summer's day met we on hill and dale
Vale forest or mead, by paved fountain or by rushy brook, or in the beached margent of the sea to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind. But with thy brawls, thou hast disturbed our sport. Therefore the winds, piping to us in vain, as in revenge have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs which falling in the land hath every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continent. The ox hath therefore stretched his yoke in vain, the plowman lost his sweat, and the green corn hath rotted ere his youth attained his years. The fold stands empty in the drowned field, and strows are fatted with the Murrian flock. The Nineland Morris is filled up with mud, and the quaint mazes in the wanton green for lack of tread are undistinguishable. Human mortals want their winter here. No night is now with him or Carol Bless. Therefore the moon, the governess of floods, pale in her anger washes all the air that rheumatic diseases do abound. And thorough this distemperature we see. The seasons alter, hoary-headed frosts fall fresh on the lap of the crimson rose and on old time's thin and icy crown and odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds is as in mockery set the spring, the summer, the triumphing autumn, angry winter change. Their wanted rivers and the mazed world by their increase now knows not which is which. And this same progeny of evil comes from our debate, from our dissension. We are their parents and original. Do you amend it then? It lies in you. <gasps> Why should Titania cross her Oberon? I do but beg a little change than boy to be my henchman. Set your heart at rest. The fairy land buys not the child of me. His mother was a votress of my order, and in the spiced Indian air by night, full often hath she gossiped by my side, and sat with me on Neptune's hill of sands. Marking the embarked traders on the flood, which we have laughed to see the sails conceive and throw big bellies with the wanton wind. But she, with pretty and with swimming gait, her womb then rich with my young squire would imitate and sail across the land to fetch me trifles and return again as from a voyage writ with merchandise. But she, being mortal of that boy, did die. And for her sake do I rear up her boy. And for her sake I will not part with him. <sighs> How long within this wood intend you stay? Perchance till after Theseus's wedding day, if you will patiently dance an hour round and see our moonlit revels go with us, if not Shun me, and I will spare your haunts. Oh, give me that boy, and I will go with thee. Not for thy fairy kingdom. Fairies away, we shall try to down right if I longer stay. Well then, go thy way. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. such dulcet and harmonious breaths that the rude sea grew civil at her song, and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to hear the sea made music. I remember it. That very time I saw that thou didst not, lying between the cold roof and the earth, Cupid, all arms, a certain aim he took at a fair vestal throned by the west, and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow that may a hundred thousand arms. Yet I might see young Cupid's fiery shaft quenched in the chaste beams of the watery moon, and the imperial bore the rest hath it on in maiden meditation, fancy free. But marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little west. 
breast in flower, before milk white, now purple with love's wound, and maidens call it love in idleness. Fetch me that flower, fear if I showed thee once. The juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid will make man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Fetch me the serve, and be thou back again ere the leviathan swivelly. I'll put a gurgle around the earth in forty minutes. Then she waking looks upon, be it on lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, on meddling monkey, or on busy ape. She shall pursue it with the soul of love, and ere I take this charm from off her sight, as I can take it with another herb, I'll make her render up her page to me. Demetrius! Get me back! But who goes here? I am invisible, and I shall overhear their conference. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? Thou toldst me they were stolen unto this wood, and here I am, and wood within this wood, because I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence, get thee gone, and follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted Ammon. Yet you draw not iron, for my heart is true as steel. Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or rather, do I not, in plainest truth, tell you that I do not, nor I cannot love you? And even for that do I love you the more. Demetrius, I am your spaniel. And the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me but as your spaniel. Burn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me. Only give me leave unworthy as I am to follow you. Worser place can I beg in your love, and yet a place of high respect with me, than to be used as you use your dog. Tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee. But I am sick when I look not on you. You do impeach your modesty too much to leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one that loves you not, to trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place, which the wit and worth is your divinity. Your virtue is my privilege, for that it is not night when I do see your face. Therefore I think I am not in the night, nor doth this wood lack worlds of company, for you in my respect are all the world. And how can it be said I am alone when all the world is here to look on me? I'll run from thee and hide me in the brakes and leave thee to the mercy of wild beasts. The wildest have not such a heart as you. Run when you will, the story shall be changed. Apollo flies and Daphne holds the chase. The dove pursues the griffin. The mild hind makes speed to catch the tiger. Bootless speed when cowardice pursues and valor flies. I will not stay thy questions. Let me go. Or if thou follow me, do not believe, but I shall do thee mischief in the wood. I in the temple, the town, the field, you do me mischief. By Demetrius, your wrongs do set a scandal on my sex. We cannot fight for love as men may do. We should be wooed and were not made to woo. I'll follow thee and make a heaven of hell to die upon the hands I love so well. Fare thee well, nymph. Ere he do leave this road, thou shalt fly him, and he shall seek thy love. Hast thou the flower there? Welcome, wanderer. I, <laughs> I pray thee, give it me. What flower? I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where hawk slips and the nodding violet grows. Quite. Eh. Over canopies of luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. There sleeps Titania sometime of the night, lulled in these flowers with dance of these light. And there the snake throws her enameled skin, weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. And 
with the juice of this, I'll streak her eyes and make her full of hateful fantasies. <laughs> Take thou some of it and seek through this grove. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do it when the next thing he espies may be the lady. Effect it with some care so that he may prove more fond of her than she upon her love. And look thou meet me ere the first cock crow. Fear not, my lord, your servant shall do so. Come now, a roundel and a fairy song, then for the third part of a minute tense, some to kill cankers in the muskrow's buds, some war with rare mice for their leathern wings to make my small elves' coats, and some to keep back that clamorous owl that nightly hoots and wanders at our quaint spirits. <sighs> Sing me now, asleep. Then to your offices and let me rest.
Theseus, when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love's sake. Love and language for his sake. Be it ounce or cat or bear, hard or spore with bristled hair, in thy eye that shall appear when thou wakest, it is thy dear. Wake when some vile thing is near. <laughs> us, Hermia, if you think it good, and tarry for the comfort of the day. Be it so, Lysander. Find you out of bed, for I upon this bank shall rest my head. One dirt shall serve as a pillow for us both. One heart, one bed, two bosoms, and one troth. <laughs> Nay, good Lysander. For my sake, my dear, lie further off yet. Do not lie so near. <sighs> oh, take the sense, sweet of my innocence. Love takes the meaning in love's conscience. I just mean that my heart and yours is knit, so that but one heart we can make it. Two bosoms interchanged with an oath, so then two bosoms and a single troth. Then by your side, no bed would me deny, for lying so, Hermia, I do not lie. Lysander riddles very prettily. Now much to screw my manners and my pride, if Hermia meant to say Lysander lies, but good friend, for love and courtesy lie further off in human modesty. Such separation may as well be said becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid. So far be distant, and good night, sweet friend. Thy love ne'er alter till thy sweet life end. Amen, amen, to that fair prayer say I. And end life when I am loyalty. Here's my bed. May sleep give thee all his rest. With half that wish, the wisher's eyes be pressed. Master said, despise his Athenian name. And hear the maid and sleeping sound on the dank and dirty ground. <laughs> Pretty soul, she durst not lie near this lack of love, this kill courtesy. Upon thy eyes I throw all the power this charm doth owe. When thou wakest, thou takest true delight. So wakest when I am gone. For now I must to Oberon. Nay, dost thou hear me, sweet Demetrius? I charge thee, hence, and do not haunt me thus. Oh, wilt thou darkling leave me? Not so. Stay on thy peril. I alone will go. Chase. The more my prayer, the lesser is my grace. Happiest Hermia, where so she lies, for she hath blessed and attractive eyes. Thou cave her eyes so bright, not with salt tears, and so mine eyes are oftener washed than hers. No, no, I am as ugly as a bear, for beasts that meet me run away from fear. Therefore, no marvel Demetrius do like a monster fly my presence thus. That wicked and dissembling glass of mine made me compare with Hermia's fiery eyne. But who is here? Lysander, on the ground? Dead or asleep? I see no blood, no wound. Lysander? If you live, good sir, awake. <gasps> and run through fire I would, for thy sweet. 
sweet Satan. Transparent Helena, nature shows art that through thy bosom makes me see thy heart. Where is Demetrius? Oh, how fit a word is that vile name to perish on my sword. Do not say so, Lysander, say not so. But though he love your Hermia, Lord, what though? Yet Hermia still loves you. Then be content. Content? With Hermia? No, I do repent. The tedious minutes with her I have spent. Tis not Hermia I love, but Helena. Who would not change a raven for a dove? The will of man is by his reason swayed, and reason says you are the worthier maid. Things growing are not ripe until their season, and I, being young till now, ripe yet to reason. Touching now the point of human skill, reason becomes the marshal to my will and leads me to your eye, where I overlook love's stories written in love's richest book. Wherefore was I to this fiend mockery born, when at your hands did I deserve this scorn? Is it not enough, is it not enough, young man, that I did never, no, nor never can deserve a sweet look from Demetrius' eye, that you must flout my insufficiency? You do me wrong, good sooth, you do. In such disdainful manner me to woo. But very well, perforce I must confess, I thought you a lord of more true gentleness. Oh, that a lady of one man refused should therefore of another be abused. She sees not Hermia. Hermia, sleep thou there, and never mayst thou come my sender near. For as a serpent of the sweetest things, the deepest loathing to the stomach brings. Of all the heresies that men did leave, are hated most of those they did deceive. Of thou, my serpent, and my heresy, of all be hated, but the most of me. And all my powers, with all my love and might, to honor Helen and be her knight. Are we all met? <laughs> pat, pat. And here is a marvelous, convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage. This hawthorn break our tiring house, and we will do it in action as we will do it before the Duke. Petroquist. What sayest thou, Bully Bob? There are things in this comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe that will never please. First, Pyramus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot possibly abide. How answer you this? Buyer Larkin, a parlor seer. <sighs> Leave my teeth the killing out when all is done. Not a whit. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue. And let the prologue seem to say that we will do no harm with our swords and that Pyramus is not killed indeed. And for the more better assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. This will put them out of fear. Well, we will have such a prologue, and it 
shall be ridden in eight and six. No, we'll make it eight and eight. Will not the ladies be afeard of the lion? I fear it, I promise you. <laughs> Masters, we ought to consider with ourselves to bring in, God shield us, a lion among ladies is a most dreadful thing, for there is not a more fearful wild fowl than your lion living, and we ought to look to it. Therefore, another proloc must tell she is not a lion. Nay, you must name her name, and half her face must be visible through the lion's neck, and she must speak through saying thus, or to the same effect. Ladies, or fair ladies, I would wish you, or I would request you, or I would entreat you not to fear my life for yours. For if you think I come hither as a lion, for pity of my life. No, I am no such thing. I am a woman as other women are. <laughs> and there indeed, let her name her name, and tell them plainly that she is snug the joiner. Well, it shall be so. But there is two hard things, that is to bring moonlight into the chamber, for fear Mrs. Disby did meet by moonlight. Doth the moon shine when I declare of life? A calendar, a calendar! Look in the almanac, find out moonshine! Yes, it doth shine that night. Yes. Why then, you may leave a casement of the great chamber window where we play open, and the moon may shine in at the casement. Aye, or else one must come in with a lantern, and the first bush of thorns they come to disfigure or to present the person of moonshine. <coughs> but there's just another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber, for Queer Mrs. Sissy says the story to talk to the chink of a wall. You can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Some man or other must present wall. <laughs> and he may have some loam or some plaster or some rough cast about him to signify wall. <laughs> and he may hold his fingers thus. And through that granny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. If that may be, then all is well. Come sit down, every mother's son, and rehearse your parts. Pyramus, you begin. When you have spoken your speech, enter into that brick. And so everyone according to his cue. What hempen homespun shall we swagger in here? I'll be an art. Ooh, an actor too, perhaps, by Sicones. Speak, Pyramus, Thisbe, stand forth. The flowers of odious savors sweet. Odors, odors. Odors, savors sweet. <laughs> so hath thy breath, my dearest Thisbe. But hark, I hear a voice. Stay thou but here a while, and by and by I will to thee appear. A stranger, Pyramus, that air put here. Must I speak now? I marry you must, for he must understand he goes but to see a noise that he heard and is to come again. Most radiant Pyramus, most lily white of hue, of color like the red rose on triumph briar, most brisky juvenile and eke most lovely Jew, as true as true as horse. But yet would never tire. I met thee, Pyramus, at Nini's tomb. Ninus tomb, man. Why you must not speak that yet? That you answer to Pyramus. You speak your part at once, Hughes and all. Pyramus enter, Hugh is past, it is never tire. Oh, as true as true as horse, but yet would never tire. If I were true, this be I were only. <gasps> and roar and burn, like horse hound hog bear fire at every turn. <laughs> Why do they run away? <laughs> this is a knavery of them to make me afeard. Oh, bottom, if thou art transformed, what do I see on thee? What do you see? 
You see an asshead of your own, do you? Bless thee, Father, bless thee. Thou art translated. I see there, neighbor. <laughs> this is to make an ass of me. <laughs> to fright me if they could. But I will not stir from this place, do what they can. I will walk up and down here, and I will sing that they shall hear I am not afraid. <coughs> the oozle cock so black of you, with orange tawny bill, the throstle with his note so true, the wren with little quill. What angel wakes me from my flower? The finch, the sparrow, and the lark, the plain song cuckoo. Whose note for many a man doth mark and never answer nay. <laughs> for indeed, who would set his wits to so foolish a purge of we fry company never so? I pray thee, To say, to swear, I love thee. <laughs> Methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. <laughs> Though in truth, love and reason keep little company together nowadays. Uh, the more the pity that some sh for our neighbors should not be friends. Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Not so, neither. But if I had enough, if I had enough wit to get myself out of this wood, I have enough to serve mine own turn. Out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common race. The summer still doth tend upon my state, and I do love thee. Therefore, go with me. I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee, and they shall fetch thee jewels from the deep. And the sing while thou on a bed of crusted flowers dost sleep, and I will prove thy mortal grossness, so that thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peace blossom, cobweb, moth, and mustard seed. Ready. And I. And I. And I. Where, where shall, shall we go? go? Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Hop in his walks and gamble in his him with apricots and dewberries, with purple grapes, green figs, and mulberries, the honey bags steal from the humble bees, and four night takers crop their waxen thighs and light them at the fiery glowworm's eyes to have my love to bide and to arise. Oh, and pluck the wings from painted butterflies to fan the moonbeams from his sleeping eyes. Nod to him, elves, and do him courtesies. Hail, mortal! Hail, hail, hail. I beg thy worship's mercy heartily. I, I beg thy worship's name. Cobweb. <laughs> Good master Cobweb. <laughs> I shall desire you of more acquaintance, Good Monsoir. If I cut my finger, I shall make bold with you. Your name, good Monsoir. Peace Blossom. <laughs> I pray you, commend me to Mistress Squash, your mother, and to Master Peace God, your father. I shall desire you of more acquaintance too, good Master Peace Blossom. <laughs> your name, good Monsieur. Good seed. I know your patience well. 
that same cowardly giant-like ox thief hath devoured many a gentleman of your house. I shall desire you of more acquaintance to some enforced chastity. <sighs> Henceforth away with thee. What? Must I repeat myself? Tie up my love's tongue. Bring him silently. I wonder if Titania be awaked. Then what was it that next came in her eye which she must dote on in extremity? Here comes my messenger. How now, mad spirit? What night rule now about this haunted grove? My mistress with a monster is in love! Near to her in consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour. A cruel patches, rude mechanicals, that were for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse a play, intended for great Theseus's nuptial ring. Mm. The thick skin of that barren sort, who Kermis presented in its sport, forsook his scene and entered in the break. <laughs> when I to him that this advantage take. An ass's null I fix it on his head, and anon his this be answered. And forth my mimic comes, when they him spy, as wild geese at the creeping fowler eye, or russet padded chops, men in sort, rising and calling at the gun's report, sever themselves and madly sweep the sky. <laughs> so has his sight, away his fellows fly. And here o'er or one falls, he murder cries, and hell from Athens calls. Their sex thus weak, lost with their fear thus strong, her senseless things began to do them wrong. Her briars and thorns at their apparel snatch. Some sleeves, some hats from yielders all things catch. I led them on in this distracted fear and left sweet Pyramus translated there. And so when it did come to pass, Tatani waked and straightway loved and danced. <laughs> <laughs> better than I could devise. <sighs> but, but, hast thou yet latched the Athenian's eyes with the love juice as I did bid thee do? I took him sleeping, that is done too. And Athenian woman? By his side. So when he waked, of course she must be eyed. Mm. Hurry up. Stand close, this is the same Athenian. This is the woman, but not this the man. What? Why rebuke you him that loves you so? Lay breath so bitter on your bitter foe. I do but chide, but I should use thee worse. For thou, I fear, hast given me cause to curse. If thou hast slain thy sender in his sleep, being o'er shoes and blood, plunge in the deep and kill me too. The sun was not so true unto the day as he to me. Would he have stolen away from sleeping Hermia? I believe as soon as this whole earth may be bored. And that the moon may through the center creep and so displease his brother's noontide with the Antipodes. It cannot be, but thou hast murdered him. 
So should a murderer look, so dead, so grim. So should the murdered look, and so should I, pierced through the heart with your stern cruelty. Yet you, the murderer, look as bright, as clear, as yonder Venus in her glimmering sphere. What's this to my Lysander? Where is he? Oh, good Demetrius, wilt thou give me him? I had rather give his carcass to my hound. Out, dog, out, cur! Thou hast driven me past the bounds of maiden's patience. Hast thou slain him then? Henceforth be never numbered among men. Oh, once. Tell true, tell true even for my sake. Durst thou have looked upon him being awake, and hast thou killed him sleeping? Oh, brave touch. Could not a worm in adder do so much? An adder did it, for with doubler tongue than thine, thou serpent never adder stung. You spend your passions on a misprized mood. I am not guilty of Lysander's blood, nor is he dead for aught that I can tell. I pray thee, tell me then that he is well. And if I could, what should I get there for? A privilege never to see me more. And from thy hated presence part I so. See me no more, whether he be dead or no. <laughs> There is no following her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, a while I will remain. Sorrow's heaviness doth heavier grow, for debt that sleep bankrupt doth owe. And with some slight measure it will pay, if for his tender here I make some stay. What hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite! Lord, what fools these mortals be! Stand aside. The noise they make will cause Demetrius to wake. Then will two at once woo one. Those things best do be a sport, for those things do best please be. That be far preposterously. Why should you think that I should woo in scorn? Scorn and derision never come in tears. Look, when I vow, I weep. And vow so born, in their nativity all truth appears. How can these things in me seem scorn to you, bearing the badge of faith to prove them true? You do advance your cunning more and more. When truth kills truth, oh devilish holy fray, these vows are Hermia's. Will you give her o'er? Weigh oath with oath, and you will nothing weigh. Your vows to her and me, put on two scales, will even weigh. And both as light as tails. I had no judgment put to her, I swore. Or none in my mind. Now you give her or. Demetrius loves her, and loves not you. Oh, Helena, goddess, nymph-perfect divine. To what, my love, shall I compare thine eye? Crystal is muddy. Oh, how ripen show thy lips, those kissing cherries tempting grow. 
that pure congealed white high Taurus snow, fanned with the eastern wind, turns to a crow. Oh, when thou holdst up thy hand, let me kiss this princess of pure white, this seal of bliss. Oh, spite! Oh, hell! I see you are all bent to set against me for your merriment. If you were civil and knew courtesy, you would not do me thus much injury. Can you not hate me as I know you do? But you must join in souls to mock me too. If you were men, as men you are in show, you would not use a gentle lady so. To vow and swear and super praise my parts, when I am sure you hate me with your hearts. You both are rivals, and love Hermia, and now both rivals to mock Helena. A trim exploit, a manly enterprise, to conjure up tears in a poor maid's eyes with your derision. None of noble sort would so offend a virgin, and extort a poor soul's patience, all to make you sport. You are unkind, Demetrius. Be not so. For you love Hermia. This you know I know. And here, with all good will, with all my heart, in Hermia's love, I do yield you up my part. And yours of Helena to me bequeath, whom I do love and will do till my death. Never did mockers waste more idle breath. Lysander! Keep thy Hermia. I will none. If e'er I loved her, all that love is gone. My heart to her but as guestwise sojourned, and now to Helen is it home returned, there to remain. Helen, it is not so! Disparage not the faith thou dost not know, lest to thy peril thou abide it dear. Look where thy love comes, yonder is thy dear. Dark night, that from the eye has function, takes the ear more quick of apprehension makes. Wherein it doth impair the seeing sense and pace the hearing double recompense. Thou art by mine eye, Lysander, found. My ear, I thank it, brought me to thy sound. Ugh. But why unkindly didst thou leave me so? Why should he stay, whom love doth press to go? What love could press Lysander from my side? Lysander's love, that would not let him by. Fair Helena, who more engilt the night than all yon fiery o's and eyes of light. Why seekest thou me? Could not this make thee know? The hate I bear thee made me leave thee so? You speak not as you think. It cannot be. Lo, she is one of this confederacy. Now I perceive they have conjoined all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me. Injurious Hermia, most ungrateful maid, have you conspired? Have you with these contrived to bait me with this foul derision? All the counsel that we two have shared, the sisters' vows, the hours that we have spent when we have chid the hasty foot in time for parting us, all was all forgot. Oh, school days friendship, childhood innocence. We, Hermia, like two artificial gods, have with our needles created both one flower, both sitting on one sample, both on one cushion, both warbling of one song both in one key, as if our hands, our sides, voices, and minds had been incorporate. And so we grew together, like to a double cherry sin parted, but yet an union in partion. Two lovely berries molded on one stem, with two seeming bodies, but with one heart. Two of the things, <sighs> like coats in heraldry, do but to one, and crowned with one crest, Will you rent our ancient love asunder to join with men in scorning your poor friend? It is not friendly. It is not maidenly. Our sex as well as I may chide you for it, though I alone do feel the injury. Lysander, as in scorn to follow me and praise my eyes and face, 
and made your other love Demetrius, who even but now did spurn me with his foot, to call me goddess, nymph, divine, rare, precious, celestial. Wherefore speaks he this to her he hates? And wherefore doth Lysander deny your love so rich within his soul, and tender me, forsooth, affection, but by your setting on, by your consent? What though I be not so in grace as you, so hung upon with love, so fortunate, but miserable most to love unloved? This you should pity rather than despise. I understand not what you mean by this. I do. Persever, counterfeit sad looks, make mouths upon me when I turn my back, hold thy sweet chest up. This sport well carried shall be chronicled. Grace or manners, you would not make me such an argument. But fare ye well, tis partly my own fault, which death or absence shall soon remedy. Oh, stay, gentle Helena! Hear my excuse, my love, my life, my soul, fair Helena! Oh, excellence, take not scorn her so! If she cannot entreat, I can compel. Thou canst compel no more than she entreats. Thy threats have no more strength than her weak prayers. Helen, I love thee. By my life I do. I swear by that I will lose for thee, to prove him false that says I love thee not. I say I love thee more than he can do. If thou say so, withdraw and prove it too. Quick, come. Lysander, where to tends all this? Away, you barnacle! <laughs> no, no, he'll seem to break loose. Take on as you would follow, but yet come not. You are a tame man. Go. Hang off, thou cat! Thou burr, vile thing, let loose rivals shake thee from me like a serpent. Why have you grown so rude? What strange is this sweet love? Thy love? Out, tawny tartar, out, O oh, loathed in medicine, O oh, hated potion hands. Do you not jest? Yes, sooth, and so do you. Demetrius, I will keep my word with thee. I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond holds you. I'll not trust your word. What? Should I hurt her? Strike her? Kill her dead? Although I hate her, I'll not harm her so. What can you do me greater harm than hate? Hate me? Wherefore? Oh, me. What news, my love? Am not I Hermia? Are not you Lysander? I'm as fair now as I was erewhile. Since night you loved me, yet since night you left me. So why then you left me? Oh, gods forbid, in earnest shall I say. I, by my life, and never did desire to see thee more. So be out of hope, of question, of doubt. Be certain, nothing truer. Tis no jest that I do hate thee and love. Love unto Demetrius, I told him of yourself unto this wood. He followed you, for love I followed him. But he hath chid me hence and threatened me, to spurn me, 
Strike me. Nay, to kill me too! No! And now, will you let me quiet go? To Athens I will bear my folly back and follow you no further. Let me go! You see how simple and how fond I am! Why get you gone? Who is that hinders you? A foolish heart that I leave here behind. What, with Lysander? With Demetrius. Be not afraid. She shall not harm thee, Helen. No, sir, she shall not, though you take her part. Oh, when she is angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school. And though she be but little, she is fierce. Little, again, nothing but low and little. Oh, why will you suffer her to flout me thus? Let me come to her. Get gone, you dwarf! You minimus of hindering not grass main! You, you be, you, you are gone! You are too officious in her behalf that scorns your services. Let her alone. Speak not of Helena, lest thou intend so little show of love to her, thou shalt abide it. Look, now she holds me not. Now follow, if thou darest, to try who's right, of thine or mine, is most in Helena. Follow? Nay, I'll go with thee cheek by jowl. <laughs> my enterprise, for I have an anointment in Athenian's eyes. And so far glad it is so sort, for their jangling I esteem a sport. Thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight. I, therefore, Robin, overcast the night. <gasps> the starry welkin cover thou anon with drooping fog as black as Acheron. And lead these testy rivals so astray as one come not within another's way. Like to Lysander, sometime frame thy tongue, then stir Demetrius up with bitter wrong, and sometime rail thou like Demetrius. And from each other look thou lead them thus, till o'er their brows death counterfeiting sleep with leaden legs and batty wings doth creep. Then crush this herb into Lysander's eye whose liquor hath such virtuous property to take from whence all error with his might and make his eyeballs roll with wanted sight. When they next awake, all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision, and back to Athens shall the lovers wend with league whose date till death shall never end. Whilst I in this affair do thee employ, I'll go to my queen and beg her Indian boy, and then I will her charm and I release from monster's view and all things shall be peace. My fair king, this must be done with haste, for knights with dragons cut the clouds full fast, and yonder shines Aurora's harbinger. At whose approach ghosts wander here or there, troop home the churchyards, damned spirits all, that in crossways and floods have burrowed, already to their roomy beds are gone. They, for fear least they shall look their shames upon, they willfully exile themselves from night, and for most I consort with black browed knight. But we are spirits of another sort. I with the morning's love have oft made sport, and like a forester the groves may tread even till the eastern gate, all fiery red, opening on Neptune with fair blessed beams turns into yellow gold his salt green streams. But 
Notwithstanding, haste, make no delay. We may affect this business yet your day. Where art thou, proud Demetrius? Speak thou now. Here, there, the drum and ready. Where art thou? I will be with thee straight. Follow me then to Plano Grad. Lysander, speak again. Thou run away, thou coward. Art thou fled? Speak. In some bush, where dost thou hide thy head? Thou coward, art thou looking to the stars and telling the bushes that thou lookest for wars and wilt not come? Come, recreant, come, thou child. I'll whip thee with a rod that is defiled. Who draws a sword on thee? Uh, yea, art thou there? Follow my voice. We'll try no manhood here. Uh, he goes before me, yet still dares me on. I come where he calls, and then he is gone. The villain is much lighter heeled than I. I followed fast. But faster did he fly. Fallen am I in that dark and even way. And here will rest me. Come thou, gentle day. For if but once thou show me thy gray beams, I'll find Demetrius and revenge this fight. Ho, 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 coward. Why comest thou not? Abide me if thou darest, for well I wot thou runst before me, shifting every place, and darest not stand nor look me in the face. Where art thou now? I am here. Nay then, thou mockst me. Thou shalt buy this dear if ever I thy face by daylight see. Now go thy way, faintness constraineth me, to measure out my length on this cold bed. By day's approach, Look to be visited. Oh, weary night. Oh, long and tedious night. Abate thy hours. Shine comforts from the east that I may back to Athens by daylight from those that my poor company detest. And sleep. That sometimes shuts up sorrow's eye. Steal me a while from mine own company. Come what's three, come one more. Two of both kinds and make up four. Four. Ah, <laughs> uh, here she is, cursed and sad. Cupid is a neighbor's lad, loves to make poor females mad. Never so in woe. He dabbled with dew and torn with briars. I can no further crawl, no further go. My legs can keep no pace with my desires. Here I will rest thee till the break of day. Heaven's shield lies sender if they mean a fray. On the ground, sleeping sounds all apply to your eye. Gentle love a remedy. When thou wakest, thou takest true delight in thy sight of thy former lady's eye. And the country proverb known, every man shall take his own. In your waking shall be shown. Jack shall have Jill, not shall go ill. The man will have his mare again, and all shall be. Where's Peace Blossom? Ready. Peace Blossom, scratch my head. Where's. Oh. Where's. Where's.
first, Master Cobweb. Oh, ready. Good, Master Cobweb. Get you your weapons in your hands and kill me a red-hipped humblebee on the top of a thistle. Oh, and good Monsieur, bring me the honey bag. And uh, don't fret yourself too much in the action. Oh, and good Monsieur, uh, have care the honey bag break not. Oh. Oh. <laughs> For I would, uh, I would be loath to see you overblown in a honey bag. Good signal. Where's Master Mushroom? <clears throat> Mustard seed, ready? Good Master Dog, well, I dare, give me your knee. Pray, leave your courtesy. What is your will? Only to help cavalry cobweb to scratch. I must to the barbers. He thinks I am marvelous hairy about the face. And I am such a tender ass, if my hair do but tickle me, I must scratch. <laughs> but wilt thou hear some music, sweet love? I have a reasonable good ear in music. Let's have the tongs and the bones. Oh. Hmm. Or say, sweet love, what thou Cyrus to eat? Truly, a peck of provender. I could munch your good dry oats. Methinks I have a desire to a bottle of hay. <laughs> Sweet hay. <laughs> good hay. <laughs> it hath no fellow. Oh. Hmm. I have a venturous fairy that shall seek thee squirrel's hoard and fetch thee new nuts. I'd rather have a handful or two of dried peas, but pray you. Let none of your people stir me, for I have an exposition of sleep come upon me. Sleep thou, and I will wind thee in my arms. Fairies, be gone, and be always away. Transform its scalp from off the head of the Athenian swain. That the awaking with the other do may all to Athens back again repair and think no more of this night's accident than as the fierce vexation of a dream. But first I will release the fairy to me. Beest thou what's wont to be, see as thou what's wont to see. <laughs> Such strength and blessed power. Now, my Titania, wake you, my sweet queen. My Oberon, what visions have I seen? Me dreamt I was enamored of an ass.
shake hands with me? Now thou and I are new in amity, and will tomorrow midnight solemnly dance in Duke Theseus' house triumphantly? Bless it all to fair prosperity. There will the faithful pairs of lovers be wedded with Theseus, all in jollity. Fair king! Attend the I do hear the morning alarm. Ah, then my queen, in silence sad, trip we out to the night's shade. We the globe can compass soon, swifter than the wandering moon. Come, my lord, and in our flight, tell me how it came this night that I, sleeping here, was found with these mortals on the ground. <laughs> Find out the forester for now. Our observation is performed. <laughs> and since we have the boward of the day, my love shall hear my hounds uncouple in the western valley. Let them go. Dispatch, I say, and find the forester. We will, fair queen, up to the mountain's top and hear the musical confusion of hounds and echo in conjunction. I was with Hercules and Cadmus once. When in a wood of Crete they bathed the bear, with hounds of Sparta never did I hear such gallant chiding. For beside the groves, the skies, the fountains, every region near seemed all one mutual cry. I never heard so musical a discord, such sweet thunder. Uh, my hounds are bred out of the Spartan kind, <laughs> so blue, so sanded, and their heads are hung with ears that sweep away the morning dew. Do laugh and crook need and do laugh like Thessalian bulls, slow in pursuit, but matched in mouth like bells, each under each. A cry more tunable was never holly to, nor cheered with thorn, in Crete, in Sparta, nor in Thessaly. Judge when you hear. Mm. Ah, but soft, what nymphs are these? My lord, that is my daughter there asleep. And, and this Lysander, and this, this Demetrius is, and this Helena, old Nedar's Helena. I, I wonder if they're being here together. Ah, uh, no doubt they rose up early to observe the rite of May, and hearing our intent, came here in grace our solemnity. <laughs> but speak, Aegeus, is not this the day that Hermia should give answer of her choice? It, it is, my lord. Pardon, my lord. Oh, I pray you all stand up. Now, I know you two are rival enemies. How comes this gentle concord in the world that hatred is so far from jealousy to sleep by hate and fear no enmity? My lord, I shall reply amazedly, half sleep, half waking. But as yet I swear, I cannot truly say how I came here. But as I speak, for truly do I think. Yes, yes, and now do I bethink me. I came with Hermia hither. Our intent was to be gone from Athens, where we might without the peril of the Athenian law. Enough! Enough, my lord, you have had enough. I beg the laws all upon his head. No, they were stolen away, they would, Demetrius, to have defeated both you and me. You of your wife and me of my consent. Of my consent that she should be your wife. My good lord. Fair Helen told me of their stealth, of their purpose hither to this wood. I, in fury, hither followed them, Helena, in fancy, following me. But, my good lord, I want not by what power, but by some power it is, my love to Hermia, melted as the snow, seems to me now as the remembrance of an idle god, which in my childhood I did dote upon, but now the faith the virtue of my heart, the object and the pleasure of mine eye, is only Helena. To her was I betrothed ere I saw Hermia, but as in sickness did I loathe this food. <laughs> but as in health, come to my natural taste. Now I do wish it, love it, long for it, and will forevermore be true to it. 
Fair lovers, you are fortunately met. Of this discourse, we will hear more anon. Aegeus, I will overbear your will. <laughs> for in the temple with us, by and by, these couples shall be eternally knit. Ah, for the morning now is something to mourn. Our purposed hunting shall be set aside. Away with us to Athens, three and three. We'll hold a feast in great solemnity. Come, Hippolyta. These things seem small and indistinguishable to me, like far-off mountains turn it into clouds. Methinks I see things with parted eye. When everything seems double, so methinks. And I have found Demetrius like a jewel, mine own and not mine own. Hmm. Are you sure that we are awake? It seems to me that yet we sleep. We dream. Do you not think the Duke was here and bid us follow him? Yea, and my father? And Hippolyta. And he did bid us follow to the temple. Why then, we are awake. Let's follow him. And by the way, let's recount our dreams. Quince, flute the bellows mender, snout the tinker, startling. <laughs> God, my life stolen hence and left me asleep. I have had a most rare vision. I have had a dream. Past the wit of a man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if you go about to expound this dream. <laughs> Methought I was, no man can say what. Methought I was, methought I had. Man is but a patched fool if he will offer to say what methought I had. The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. I will get Petra Quince to write me a ballad of this dream. It shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom. <laughs> and I will sing it in the latter end of a play before the Duke. Peradventure, to make it the more gracious, I shall sing it at her death. If he come not, then the play is marred. It goes not forward. Doth it? It's not possible. You have not a man in all Athens able to discharge Pyramus, but he. No, he is simply the best whip of any handcraftman in Athens. Yea, and the best person, too. He's the very paramour for a sweet voice. You must say paragon. A paramour's God bless us. A thing or not. Masters. Masters. There are two or three lords and ladies more married. If our sport had gone forward, we should all have been made men. Oh, sweet bully bottom. Thus has he lost sixpence a day during his life. He could not escape sixpence a day. And the Duke has not given him sixpence a day for playing pyramids. I'll be hanged. He would have deserved it too. Sixpence a day in pyramids. Or nothing. Where are these lads? Where are these dogs? Bottom, almost 
pleasant day and most happy hour. Masters, I am to discourse wonders. But ask me not what, for if I tell you, I am no true Athenian. I will tell you everything right as it fell out. Let us hear, sweet father. Not a word of me. All that I will tell you is that the Duke hath dined. Get your apparel together, good strings to your beards, new ribbons to your pumps. Meet at the palace presently. Everyone look o'er their part, for the short and the long is, our play is preferred. Yes. In any case, let Thisbe have clean linen. And let not her that plays the lion's part pare her nails, for they shall hang out for the lion's claws. And most dear actors, eat no onions nor garlic. <laughs> for we are to utter sweet breath, and I do not doubt but to hear them say, it is a sweet comedy. No more words, away! Go away! <laughs> speak of? Uh, more strange than true. I never may believe these antique fables, nor these fairy toys. Uh, lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. Uh, the lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That is the madman. The lover, all is frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye and a fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shape and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Such tricks have strong imagination that if it would apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed to bear? But all the story of the night told over? And all their minds transfigured so together. More witnesseth than fancies images, and grows to something of great constancy, but however so, so strange and admirable. Oh, here come the lovers, full of joy and mirth. <laughs> joy, gentle friends, joy and fresh days of love accompany your hearts. More than to us, your royal walks, your boards, your beds. Come now, what masks, what dances shall we have to wear away this long age of three hours between our after supper and bedtime? Where is our usual manager of mirth? What revels are in hand? Is there no play to ease the anguish of a torturing hour? Call Philistrate! Here, my Tapesius. Uh, say, what abridgment have you for this evening? What masks? What music? How shall we beguile the lazy time, if not with some delight? There is a brief. How many sports are ripe? Make choice of which your highness will see first. Ah, the battle of the centaurs, to be sung by an Athenian eunuch to the harp. <laughs> well, none of that. <laughs> that have I told my love and the glory of my kinsman Hercules. <laughs> um, the riot of the tipsy bacchanals, tearing the Thracian singer in their rage. <laughs> That is an old device, and it played when I came from Thebes, last a conqueror. Uh, uh, the thrice three muses mourning for the death of learning, late deceased in beggary. That is some satire, keen and critical, not sorting with a nuptial ceremony. Uh, a tedious, brief scene of a young Pyramus and his love Thisbe. Very tragical mirth. Merry and tragical, <laughs> tedious and brief? <laughs> that is hot ice in a wondrous strange snow. How shall we find the concord of this discord? A play there is, my lord, some ten words long, which is as brief as I have known a play, but by ten words, my lord, it is too long. <laughs> which makes it tedious. Yes. For in all the play there is not one word apt, nor one player fitted. 
and tragical my noble lord it is. For Pyramus Varen doth kill himself. Which, I must confess, when I saw rehearsed, made mine eyes water, but more merry tears. <laughs> the passion of loud laughter never shed. What are they that do play it? Hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which never labored in their minds till now, and have now toiled their unbreathed memories with this same play against your nuptial. And we will hear that play. No, 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 my noble lord, it is not for you, for I have heard it over, and it is nothing, nothing in the world, unless you can find sport in their intents, extremely stretched, Hund with cruel pain to do you service? Yes. I will hear that play, for never <laughs> anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Go, bring them in. Uh, and take your places, ladies. I love not to see wretchedness or charged and duty in his service perishing. My gentle sweet, you shall see no such thing. She says they can do nothing in this kind. The kinder we to give oh. them thanks for nothing. <laughs> Our sport shall be to take what they mistake. And what poor duty cannot do, noble respect takes it in might, not merit. Where I have come, great, great clerks have purposed said to greet me with premeditated welcomes, where I've seen them shiver and look pale, make periods in the midst of sentences, and throttling their practiced accents and their fears have dumbly broke off, not paying me welcome. Trust me, sweet. Out of this silence, yet I picked a welcome, and in the modesty of fearful duty, I write as much from the rattling tongue of saucy and audacious eloquence. Love, therefore, and tongue-tied simplicity, in least speak most <laughs> to my capacity. So please, your grace, the prologue is addressed. Let them approach. <laughs> Goodwill, that you should think we come not to offend, but with goodwill, show our simple skill. That is the true beginning of our end. Consider then we come but in despite. We do not come as minding to contest you. Our true intent is all for your delight. We are not here, that you should here repent you. The actors are at hand, and by their show, you should know all that you were like to know. This fellow doth not stand upon points. She hath rid her prologue like a rough colt. She knows not the stop. A good moral, my lord, tis not enough to speak, but to speak true. Indeed, she hath played on her prologue like a child on a recorder. A sound, but not in government. <laughs> <laughs> Speech is like a tangled chain. Nothing impaired, but all disordered. <laughs> Who is next? Perchance you wonder at the show, but wonder on till truth makes all things plain. This man is Pyramus, if you will know. This beauteous lady Thisbe is certain. This man with lime and rough cast doth present wall, that vile wall which Jiffy's lovers sunder. And through walls chink poor souls they are content to whisper, at the which let no man wonder. This man with lanthorn dog and bush of thorns presented moonshine, if forth you will know. By moonshine did these lovers think no scorn to meet at Ninus tomb, there there to woo. This grisly beast, which lion hide by name, the trusty Thisbe, coming first by night, did scare away, or rather, did affright. And as she fled, her mantle she did fall, which lion vile with bloody mouth did stain. Anon comes Pyramus, sweet youth and tall, and finds this trusty Thisbe's mantle slain, whereat with blade, with bloody blameful blade, he bravely broached his boiling bloody breast. And Thisbe, tearing in mulberry shade, his dagger drew and died. 
For all the rest, let lie and moonshine wall and lovers twain, and large discourse, while here they do remain. I wonder if the lion be to speak. No wonder, my lord. One lion may when many asses do. <laughs> In this same interlude, it doth befall that I, one snout by name, present a wall. <laughs> and such a wall as I would have you think had in it a cranny hole or chink through which the lovers, Pyramus and Thisbe, did often whisper very secretly. This loam, this rough cast, and this stone doth show that I am that same wall. The truth is so. And this the cranny is, bright and sinister, through which the lovers are to whisper. Would you desire lime and hair to speak better? <laughs> it is the wittiest partition that e'er I heard this course my life. <laughs> <laughs> Pyramus draws near the wall. Silence. O oh, grim-looked knight, O oh, night with hue so black, O oh, night, which ever art when day is not. O oh, night, O oh, night, alack, 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 I fear my Thisbe's promise is forgot. And thou, O oh, wall, O oh, sweet and lovely wall, that stands between her father's ground and mine, thou wall, O oh, wall, <laughs> O oh, sweet, O oh, lovely wall. <laughs> Show me thy chink to blink through with mine eye. <laughs> Thanks, courteous wall. <laughs> Jove shield thee well for this. <laughs> but what see I? No, Thisbe, do I see. O oh, wicked wall, through whom I see no bliss. Oh, 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 me thinks being sensible should curse again? No, sir, in truth you should not. Deceiving me is the like you will see it. We'll all by heart as I told you. Yonder she comes. Oh, wall, how often hath I heard thy moans? For parting my fair pair misses me. My cheery lips have often kissed thy stone. Thy stone with lime and hair knit up in thee. I see a voice. Now will I to the chink to spy, and I can hear my Thisbe's face. Thisbe! My love thou art, my love I think. Think what thou wilt, for I am thy lover's grace, and like Lymander, I am trusty still. And like Helen, to fates me kill. Not Shephelus to Procris was so true. A Shephelus to Procris, I to you. Oh, kiss me through the hole of this vile wall. I kiss the wall's hole, not your lips at all. <laughs> Wilt thou meet me at Ninny's tomb straight away? <laughs> tight life, tight death, I come without delay. Thus have I, wall, my part discharged so, and being done, thus wall away doth go. <laughs> now is the mural down between the two neighbors. When walls are so willful to hear without warning, there is no remedy, my lord. Well, this is the silliest stuff that ever I heard. The best in this kind are but shadows, and the worst are no worse if imagination amend them. It must be your imagination, then. <laughs> if we imagine no worse of them than they of themselves, they may pass for excellent men. Here come two noble beasts and a man and a lion. You, ladies, you, whose gentle hearts do fear, the smallest monstrous mouse that creeps on the floor, may now crack hence, or quake and tremble here, when thine rough wild's rage doth roar, to know that I, as snug the joiner, am a lion fell nor else nor lion Very gentle beast of a good conscience. The best of beasts that e'er I saw. Mm. This lion is a very fox for her valor. True. And of use for her discretion. Ah, uh, not so, my lord, for her valor cannot carry her discretion. <laughs> her valor, I'm sure, cannot carry her discretion, for the goose carries not the fox. <laughs> it is well. Leave it to her discretion and let us listen to the moon. This lanthorn doth the horned moon present. Should have worn the horns on his head. He 
is no crescent, and his horns are invisible within the circumference. This lanthorn doth the horned moon present. I, the mayth moon, do seem to be. <laughs> this is the greatest error of all the rest. The man should be put into the lanthorn. <laughs> How is it else the mayth moon? He dares not go there for the candle, for you see it is already in snuff. I am aweary of this moon. What he would change? It appears by his small light of discretion that he is in the wane, but yet in courtesy and all reason we must stay the time. Proceed, moon. All I have to say is that this lanthorn is the moon, I, the man of the moon, this thorbush, my thorbush, and this dog. Woof! <laughs> my dog. Why all these should be in the lanthorn, for all these are in the moon. But silence, here comes Thisbe. This is a ninny's tomb. Where is my love? <laughs> <laughs> Then came Pyramus. And so the lion vanished. I thank thee, moon, for thy sunny beams. For now, by thy gracious, golden, glittering gleams, I trust to take of truest Thisbe sight. <laughs> but stay, O oh spite, but mark, poor knight, what dreadful dole is here. Eyes, do you see? How can it be? O oh, dainty duck, O oh dear, thy mantle good, what, stained with blood? <laughs> Approach, ye furies fell. O oh, fates, come, come, cut thread and thrum, quail, crush, conclude, and quell. This passion and the death of a dear friend would go near to make a man look sad. Be sure, my heart, but I pity the man. Oh, wherefore, nature, didst thou lions frame? Since lion vile hath here deflowered, my dear. <laughs> which is, no, no, which was the fairest dame that ever lived, that loved, that liked, that looked with cheer. Come tears, confound, out sword and wound. The pap of Pyramus, I, that left pap, where heart doth hop. <sighs> thus die I, thus, thus, thus. Now I'm dead. <laughs> now I'm fled. My soul is in the sky. Tongue, lose thy light. Moon, take thy flight. Now die. 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 No die but an ace for him, for he is but one. Less than an ace, for he is dead. He is nothing. With the help of a surgeon, he might yet recover and yet prove an ass. <laughs> oh, how chance Moonshine is gone before Thisbe comes back and finds her lover? She will find him by starlight. Ah, here she comes, and her passion ends the play. Oh, Methinks she should not use a long one for such a Pyramus. I hope she will be brief. A mote will turn the balance. Which Pyramus, which Thisbe, is the better? He for a man, God warrant us. She for a woman, God bless us. She hath spied him already with those sweet eyes. And thus she means good illicit. Asleep, my love? What dead my dove? Oh, here, Mr. Rice! <laughs> speak, speak, quite dumb. Dead! Dead! A two must cover my eyes. These oily lips, this cherry nose, these yellow calcined cheeks are gone, are gone! Lovers, they moan. His eyes were gray. 
my friends, first Thisbe, and adieu, adieu, adieu. Moonshine and Lion are left to bury the dead. <laughs> and Walt, too. No, sir, the wall is down the part of their box. <laughs> A Virgo mass dance between two of our players. Uh, no, no, no epilogue, I pray you, for your play needs no excuse. Never excuse, for when all the players are dead, there needs none to be blamed. <laughs> Mary, if he that writ it had played Pyramus and hanged himself in Thisbe's garter, it would have made a fine tragedy. <laughs> and so it is, very truly notably discharged. Uh, come your Virgo mask, but let your epilogue alone. <laughs> this solemnity and nightly revels and new jollity. Now the hungry lion roars and the wolf behowls the moon. Whilst the heavy plowman snores, all with weary task for dawn. Now the wasted brands do glow, whilst the screech owl screeching loud hoots the wench that lies in woe in remembrance of a shroud. Now it is the time of night that the graves all gaping wide. Everyone lets forth his sprite in the churchway paths to glide. Now the fairies that do run by the triple hecate team in the presence of the sun, following darkness like a dream. Now we frolic not a mouse shall disturb this hollow house. I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. Through the house give glimmering light by the dead and drowsy fire. Every elf and fairy sprite hop as light as bird from briar. And this ditty after me, sing and dance it trippingly. First, rehearse your song by rote. To each word a warbling note. Hand in hand with fairy grace will we dance and bless this place. Now until the break of day, through this house each fairy stray. To the best bride bed will we, which by us shall blessed be, and the issue there create ever shall be fortunate. So shall all the couples three ever true in loving be, and the blots of nature's hand shall not in their issue stand, never mole, hair lip, nor scar, nor mark prodigious, such as are despised in nativity, shall upon their children be. With this field do consecrate, Every fairy take his gate, and each several chamber bless through this palace with sweet peace, and the owner of it blessed ever shall in safety rest. 
trip away, make no stay. Meet me all by break of day. If we shall us have offended, think but this, and all is mended. That you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear, and this weak and idle theme, no more yielding, but a dream. Gentles do not reprehend, for if you pardon, we will mend. And as I as an honest puck, if we have our learned luck, now to escape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere night's long. Else the puck a liar call. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and robbers shall store men. <laughs>